the microphone off. <laughs> if they go for more than their 30 minutes. So please be restrained. And an additional request on this is please, those of you who are answering questions, try to be short and to the point. Don't give counter lectures because that's a bit pointless. Try and get your idea down to two or three sentences and there can be a bit of discussion instead of giving us a discourse to show you how wonderful your memory is. <laughs> we assume everyone's memory is at least better than mine. Now, that said, it's, I was particularly glad when uh, Mr. Kulik and Mr. Tauber asked me to chair this session because it's, it's three friends of mine, so it's very nice to chair your own friends. And the first one, I'm warning you though, 20 minutes I'm going to start meeting <laughs> you. Okay. It's fine. No context yet. Okay. Uh, uh, the first session is Professor Lorenzo Di Tommaso from Trinity University. Yes? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm getting all mixed up. McGill, Canada. Montreal. 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 And he is probably known to most of us for his uh, many memories. What every graduate student knows is his great thick bibliography of the pseudepigrapha. I think they've not got to the best of him when they've done that. Uh. But his work on Daniel, his forthcoming work that I can commend to you before it's out on apocalypticism. Thank you. And uh, just a fine scholar and a very nice fellow. So, Lorenzo, with those <laughs> words, Thanks. you can get going and okay. I can write here okay. five minutes with a piece of paper that's right on the other side. Here. There, is there a handout to go? No. Oh, okay. Are you going to read sitting down? I think I'll read sitting down. We okay? I don't, I don't think I need... You can you hear me back there? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, I don't think I need that. So. Thanks, anyway. <clears throat> Thank you. If we are to examine the cultural archaeology, of Jews and Slavs with reference to the apocalyptic literature, we may profitably, profitably divide the evidence into two basic categories. The first category consists of ancient Jewish apocalyptic texts, or versions of texts, that are preserved in manuscript copies in Slavonic translation. This corpus, relatively well known outside the study of Slavonic culture, since historically it has attracted the interest of scholars, who work in the field of early Judaism, and particularly scholars with a special interest in the so-called Old Testament pseudepigrapha. For this reason, and also because of limitations of time, my comments concerning this category will necessarily be brief. It must be said at the outset that few of the texts in this first category are completely free from scholarly debate regarding their inclusion. I speak here not only with reference to issues of their origin, but also of their provenance. That is to say, the historical path from their origin to their earliest attestations in the manuscript evidence. It is not my purpose here to engage in the ongoing and fruitful dialogue on the issue of the classification of the pseudepigrapha, or whether Jewish or Christian is the most appropriate default position although I will say that the idea of a default position is not really helpful. But the dialogue itself cannot be ignored. And so perhaps we should think of these texts not as belonging to a homogeneous category, but rather, for our purposes at least, as occupying points along a spectrum of possibilities. At the near end of the spectrum are those apocalyptic texts which are preserved in Slavonic versions or translations, and which most likely originated in Second Temple Judaism. These include the Apocalypse of Abraham, Second Enoch, and Third Baruch. That being said, it seems as if the debate is not entirely closed about Second Enoch, and I look forward to hearing more on the origin and provenance of this apocalypse at a conference in London next month. Also in their present state, Several of these texts preserve Jewish apocalyptic compositions to which Christian elements have been added 
a good example being 4th Baruch. Next in line on this imaginary spectrum is a text such as the Ladder of Jacob, which despite its complicated provenance, <coughs> appears to have preserved several early traditions that can be safely located within a first century CE Jewish setting. Further along the spectrum is the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. It is clear that portions of the Testaments drew on earlier Jewish apocalyptic material. Yet in its present form, the Testaments is essentially a Christian document, and it is not yet possible to locate the text or any portion of it, extended that is, in Second Temple Judaism. Also, if I recall correctly, the Slavonic text of the Testaments is not particularly valuable in reconstructing the Greek state, Greek text, excuse me, to a state earlier than that of the present manuscript evidence. At the far end of the spectrum are those texts which are preserved in Slavonic and were either once considered to be early Jewish in their origin, such as the Ascension of Isaiah, or have at one point been classified as part of the Old Testament pseudepigrapha, such as the so-called Apocalypse of Daniel, but which in all cases are clearly Christian and are of a late antique or early medieval vintage. But these texts are hardly unimportant, as I will describe in a short while. Now, if we consider this first category of early Jewish apocalyptic texts, it is clear that the fact that any given apocalypse is preserved only in Slavonic manuscripts is unimportant. Those who spend time working with manuscripts, ancient or medieval, know full well the chance quality of textual preservation. And new discoveries are always being made, the good example here being the 2009 discovery of Coptic fragments of Second Enoch. What is more interesting is the quality of these apocalyptic texts. The topic of medieval Jewish mysticism very much extends beyond my particular academic interests, as too does the question of its ancient origins. But I do think that Andrei Orlov has demonstrated sufficiently that a significant proportion of these texts display certain common qualities, including a marked tendency to the theophanic and angelological imagery. So in this important respect, and despite a gap of many centuries, the Slavonic manuscripts serve as literary monuments to an important stage in the history and development of early Jewish mysticism. This brings me to the second category of apocalyptic texts that have some bearing on the issue of the cultural archaeology of Jews and Slavs, and the chief subject of my paper today. In addition to preserving examples of early Jewish apocalyptic literature, which in some cases represent the sole manuscript evidence, the Slavonic tradition also bears manuscript witness to a host of apocalyptic texts that were composed in post-classical times, that is to say, from the late 4th or 5th centuries onwards. Many times these post-classical texts were composed outside the Slavonic milieu, that is to say, they were written at an earlier time and in a different language, and are also preserved in Slavonic. Other times, however, these texts were products of the Slavonic apocalyptic tradition. It makes little sense to read a complete list of both types of apocalyptic literature, suffice to say that this list would be quite long. Again, Andrei Orlov has done a masterful job in identifying these texts in his full bibliography of the Slavonic pseudepigrapha. Some of the more important apocalyptic texts include the Revelations of Pseudomethodius, the Ascension of Isaiah, and some apocalyptic texts attributed to the biblical prophet Daniel, about which I will shortly say more. The prophecy of Leo the Wise, which is known by several titles, is also important, as is the Slavonic version of the Sibylla Tiburtina and other Sibylline prophecies. There are a fairly large number of medieval Jewish apocalyptic texts as well. These may be less known to scholars, who are specialists in Slavonic language and Slavic culture, but they are included in several seminal collections, most notably Jelinek's Beit HaMidrash, and have been translated into English by John Reeves in his recent and highly useful anthology, Trajectories in Near Eastern Apocalyptic. Among the most significant of these documents are the Sefer Elijah and the Sefer Zerubbabel, which bears no relationship to the Slavonic Apocryphon of Zerubbabel. In addition, there are at least three apocalyptic texts attributed to Daniel, including a Hebrew vision of Daniel, which is incompletely preserved in a unique manuscript leaf from the Cairo Geniza, an untitled composition that is also incompletely preserved 
in three and a half folia from the Geniza, and now in St. Petersburg, and an apocalypse which is written in Judeo-Persian and which is presently located in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Hmm? Yes, that's right. To the best of my knowledge, none of these medieval Jewish apocalyptic texts is preserved in manuscript copies in Slavonic. To the best of my knowledge, and like the core texts in the first category, none of the medieval apocalyptic texts preserved in Slavonic were composed by Jews. If this were the end of the story, the possibilities for interaction between Jews and Slavs in the Byzantine centuries within the broad compass of medieval apocalyptic literature would be rather limited. But that's not the end of the story. Now, I don't know the end of the story, but I do think I know the beginning of it. We are still not familiar enough about apocalyptic literature in the late antique and medieval centuries. This rather bold statement on my part does not mean to diminish the previous or ongoing scholarship, nor does it ignore the many excellent studies that have been published on specific texts, such as the Apocalypse of Pseudo-Methodius, the Vision of Tundel, the Fifteen Signs of Doomsday, or the Tiburtine Sibyl. My point, however, is that much of this work derives from a sense of the manuscript evidence that is fundamentally incomplete, and because of this, frequently misunderstood. We are so used to the concept of discrete texts and the genetic history of their composition, transmission, and reception, that it is very difficult not to understand the manuscript evidence in any other way. That's perfectly fine when the subject of our inquiry is the book of Daniel, that's the biblical book of Daniel, the Gospel of Luke, or Cicero's De Republica. And his focus on the text also holds true for many late antique and medieval apocalypses, which were composed, copied, and copied again over a span of many centuries and in multiple contexts without losing with what we might call their textual identity. Examples of the type are not uncommon, as, for example, the 14th vision of Daniel, which is preserved in both Coptic and Arabic, and whose original form, it seems, go back to the Coptic revolts of the 760s. But, the, but for the bulk of medieval apocalyptica, the manuscript evidence would appear to suggest that a markedly different sort of process of composition and transmission was at work, a process that hints at new possibilities for the cross-cultural interaction of literary traditions and textual material. One of the pioneers of this approach, at least with respect to apocalyptic literature, was Paul Alexander, who is known, among other things, for his superb monograph on the Byzantine apocalyptic tradition. In it, Alexander discusses a range of texts, including what he called Slavonic Daniel. According to Alexander, Slavonic Daniel is very much a composite text. Its first four sections are unique, its next four sections are parallel in the Greek apocalyptic oracle known in other manuscripts as the Discourses of John Christostom, and its fin final two sections are borrowed from the Greek Pseudo-Methodius. What Alexander demonstrated, both with respect to the Slavonic Daniel and a number of the other apocalyptic texts he examined, was their essentially bricolage nature. They had been assembled from bits and pieces of other texts. But even if Alexander was open to this process of recombinant recycling of apocalyptic oracles, he still remained indentured to the perspective that the manuscript evidence could be described genetically, with discrete texts as the basic units. For example, his Slavonic Daniel was merely one of several extant versions of an apocalypse of Daniel. His view, therefore, was simply a reboot of the old paradigm about these apocalypses, which had dominated scholarship since the late 19th century, the first golden age of pseudepigrapher research, and which lasted until the outbreak of the Great War in Europe. The paradigm went something like this. In the beginning, there was a single Apocalypse of Daniel, which is now lost, and which was written in Greek sometime after the withdrawal of the imperial authority in the West, yet before the rise of Islam. This apocalypse, which is preserved in an Armenian manuscript copies and is known in that form as the seventh vision of Daniel, was the parent text from which the rest of the Greek Daniel apocalypse is derived, about six to eight, out of the total of a number of between nine to twelve texts, depending on which authority one consulted. 
A few of the other apocalyptica, the two Syriac Daniel apocalypses, for example, and the Jewish examples, stood outside the mainstream, even if they did draw upon common themes and motifs. But today, the manuscript evidence no longer supports this archetype and its later versions and translations. The Diegesis Danielis presents a textbook illustration of my point. This text is probably the best known of all the Daniel Apocalyptica, principally because it was included, despite its obvious Byzantine origin, in the first volume of James Charlesworth's Old Testament Pseudepigrapha. Yeah. Common opinion holds that this text, in Greek, survives in three very late Byzantine manuscript copies, one in Venice, one in Oxford, and the third in Montpellier. However, the text of the Venetian manuscript varies so widely from the other two manuscripts that its editor was obliged to print it separately, considering it to be a widely variant expression of the text. It is now clear, however, that the Venetian manuscript is more closely related to a different text, the Vision and Revelation of Daniel, which also survives in a Slavon Slavonic manuscript published over a century ago by Istvin. Although the two manuscripts are not identical, they clearly preserve a similar composition. Therefore, it is more precise to say that instead of preserving one of three extant Greek copies of the Diagesis, the Venetian manuscript more closely represents a copy of a different document. Now this is not to say that the four manuscripts are unrelated. However, they are not copies of the same text, and the relationship is sufficiently distant as to require a synoptic edition rather than a critical one. This is one example out of many. And if we consider the, the, that there are at least 24 different Daniel apocalypses, which are extant in eight different languages, and in at least 100 manuscripts, plus at least 100 manuscripts more whose existence may be deduced from information in the catalogs, the textual situation becomes correspondingly more complicated. Let me now withdraw the focus of our inquiry and regard the problem from the panoramic view. When we consider the post-classical apocalyptic literature in its fullness, using the apocryphal Daniel Apocalyptica as a lens, so to speak, we can say with a high degree of confidence that it is not possible to understand this corpus solely in genetic terms, nor can the relationship among its units be always be described schematically. Let me also add that this recombinatory process is a hallmark not only of the apocalyptic writings from the Byzantine galaxy. It is also characteristic of Western apocalyptic texts, such as the Apocalypse of Thomas, which exists in both Latin and in Old English, and the 15 signs of doomsday, which exists in Latin and in every major vernacular language of the West. It is furthermore characteristic of medieval apocryphal literature in general, good illustrations being the Pilate cycle of writings, the medieval Alexander cycle, and much of the literature associated with the various patriarchs, prophets, and apostles. More often than not, the principal vehicles for the transmission of literary traditions in this material were smaller units. It is not possible to be more specific than this, and in fact a discussion of this topic would take us well beyond the mandate of our conference. However, in the case of the medieval apocalyptic literature, it is fairly clear that this baseline unit was more often than not the individual oracle, which formed the building blocks of new compositions. Importantly, this process was not limited to the Daniel Apocalyptica. I have noted that the Diegesis is preserved in two Greek manuscript copies, but as it turns out, neither copy is actually ascribed to Daniel. The Oxford text claims Methodius as its author, while the Montpellier text is anonymous. Only the Venetian text actually credits Daniel, which leaves us in the, us in the uncomfortable position of having named a text on the basis of a title that properly belongs to another composition. And this overlap in ascription transcends titles. Some Daniel texts contain oracles which in other manuscripts are attributed to Leo the Wise, or sometimes to Pseudo-Methodius. So in a certain way, we can speak of a Daniel-Methodius apocalyptic complex, which included relatively stable texts, like the Apocalypse of Pseudo-Methodius and its many variants and recensions, and the last vision of Daniel, 
which exists in Greek and Slavonic, along with this great other mass of apocalyptic material, out of which precipitated the literature that we find exhibited in these various manuscripts. How the Sibylline material fits this pattern, I can't say just yet. The Daniel Apocrypha never traveled to the West, whereas the Sibylline certainly did. But it's obvious that there was a separate Sibylline apocalyptic complex of material which spanned both East and West, and which also displays this complicated combination of relatively stable texts and fluid material. And so we must ask the question, how does all this shed light on the potential interaction between Jews and Slavs? I must confess that I was much, very much taken by Alexander Kulik's concept of cultural archaeology and also by the tasks associated with the enterprise, to use Alexander's phraseology, to work through the layers of extant texts, to reconstruct contexts, and to recover earlier texts. Such tasks very much encapsulate the attitude that underwrites the processes necessary to understand the early Jewish apocalyptic literature preserved in the Slavonic manuscript copies, which is the first category of apocalyptic texts I described. And we see this attitude reflected graphically in one of Alexander's three major subgroups under the heading corpora with unclear boundaries, specifically the subgroup here in the middle labeled Slavonic Apocrypha, Jewish Hellenistic, and versus early Christian versus medieval Jewish, right here. What I wonder, under this same category, whether is whether there is room for a fourth subgroup under the he same heading, as I said, perhaps with the title Medieval Apocrypha, and which would include the medieval apocalyptic literature. This subgroup would not necessarily be diachronic, as the Slavonic su Apocrypha subgroup is, because the goal would not be to work through the stratification of the centuries, although this is part of the task, or to recover earlier texts, because as we have seen, quite often, it is not possible to describe the manuscripts in this fashion. This category would also include, thank you, this category would also include Jewish and Christian and Islamic. I'll return to this point in a minute. It would furthermore involve Byzantine and Eastern material primarily, but would also be attentive to developments in the West. To put all this into perspective, if one regards the medieval apocalyptic material with a mindset that focuses on texts and stomata and genetic relationships, then the prospects for cultural interaction among Jews and Slavs is rather limited, as I've already said. But a completely different picture emerges, emerges when one's focus shifts to the smaller units, like individual oracles, spread across the rich tapestry of the manuscript evidence, and to themes and motifs distinctive to the medieval apocalyptica, which in the 1970s, Klaus Berger charted across no less than 188 different compositions. There, the old boundaries fade somewhat. They do not disappear. No one is claiming that. But they become porous. This new subgroup would work from the premise that the processes of transmission are not automatically linear, but they can also be radial with cortex providing mere material in the form of discrete oracles and prophecies, as well as motifs like the last Roman emperor and the enclosed nations that were used and reused time and again in often unique combinations. In conjunction with acknowledging new lines of transmission, this new subgroup would also recognize that medieval apocalyptic literature was not necessarily the province of the intellectual classes or the scribes, although it could be, of course. But there is more than enough evidence to suggest that apocalyptic letter, literature, then as now, was also produced for and appreciated by others among the population. So in some ways, they are like prognostic texts, and like horoscopes, and physiognomies, and magical and medical books, and books on dream interpretation, all of which exhibit a far greater tendency to cross boundaries that would be otherwise fortified by theological or cultural barriers. And most significantly of all, this notion of a progression from Jewish to Christian, which works very well for the Old Testament pseudepigrapha, would be replaced by this new subgroup. For there is, or in this new subgroup, excuse me, for there is no doubt in my mind 
that the medieval apocalyptic tradition originated in very late antique Christianity, probably at the end of the fourth century, and was later picked up by medieval Judaism and Islam. Now, I am not claiming that Sefer Zerubbabel is a Jewish reworking of a late fourth century Christian text. But I am recognizing that so many of the major themes and motifs in medieval Jewish apocalypses make their first appearance in Christian apocalyptic texts. Naturally, this is true also for the Islamic apocalyptica, although, again, there are distinctive elements that characterize an Islamic apocalypse. My point is that there was a back-and-forth transmission of apocalyptic ideas that quite obviously transcended traditional boundaries. For example, I mentioned the two Daniel apocalypses from the Geniza, which exhibit multiple elements that appear quite regularly in Christian and Slavonic apocalyptic texts. So perhaps there is a shared text, and if not in these apocalypses, then in others. And that's the key. In my opinion, only perhaps one-third of the manuscripts have been identified, far less so among the Arabic manuscripts. And of these, less than half have been studied. The potential for new discovery is very high, and not in just some obscure library that no one has yet bothered to visit. Any one of the world's great manuscript libraries still contains many treasures to be discovered. That is a guarantee. Therefore, when you put it all together, the possibility for contact between Jews and Slavs in the province of medieval apocalyptic literature becomes more promising than perhaps originally thought. But, as I said, this is only the beginning of the story, and a great deal of work remains to be done. Thank you. We are only two minutes over the lecture allotted time, so there's some time for questions. Great term. <laughs> Terrific term. Outstanding term. <laughs> Whatever its provenance. We will see what is worthwhile tomorrow when I'll explain what it means. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but no Masonic imagery, I'll tell you that. Right. Except in the um, modern apocalypse. Yes. Mark, do you I have mean, I'm a bit worried about your comparisons between uh, this literature and the so-called pseudo-scientific literature of physiognomics and omen, divination, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I wonder if this is a bit facile, because the uh, uh, point about this other literature is, is it's essentially secular in its form. And it's, it's, it's recognizing that there are certain natural laws which govern uh, the running of things without necessarily divine intervention. And I think that that means that they're fundamentally different from the literature that you're discussing. Thematically, perhaps, although we have a disagreement on that, I think um, dream interpretation books are, could not be considered solely secular. Um, I know you're very familiar with um, astrolabs and astronomical texts, which in, in uh, Western man uh, medieval manuscript books are inevitably uh, uh, correlated with the uh, Christian liturgical calendar. Um, but that's not, I don't think that's the point I'm trying to make. What I'm trying to say is like those texts, uh, let me add one more point, of course, I think this is well known to everyone, don't make it anyway. But um, quite often these apocalyptic texts are bound together in manuscript books containing prognostic texts and so on and so forth. So somebody at one time, not just one person, but 20 and more, thought that these texts belonged together for whatever reason. Commonplace book, it could be anything. But I'm, I'm not so much interested in, 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 in the, the nature of the texts themselves, but in their vehicle, um, the vehicles by which they were transmitted and the lines of transmission that they exhibit. So um, I, I, I can only say that this seems to me the case, having done some work on the um, uh, Daniel Dream books, the Somniala Danielis, it's quite clear it's, um, it's that way as well. And in, on, on, in addition to that, I'd say the 15 signs of dooms, they also figure in that. I can't say it's true for every text, though. So, I mean, there may be certain exceptions to the rule. Other questions? No, everyone's trying to digest the existence of this category. You know. Me? Yeah, no, idea. no, yeah. <laughs> this sort of thing. Uh, a thought, of course, if I, if I may, because there is, a, there are a couple more minutes. Uh, 
what you say has implications for the addition for textology, what would be called textology, that is to say for what we assume about text when we edit them. Mm. And I think this would be a worthy subject of some, a subject worthy of rather sustained attention. If we're saying that these sort of genetic Lachmanian patterns don't really work in this material, mm -hmm. but there are obviously some sort of relationships, then we have a problem of how do we describe those relationships, which is one set of problems. And we have another set of problems, which is what are the Zitze im Leben, if you wish, the context the authoring context, the authoring practices that produce literature of this sort. And where was it used? How did it function? How was it put together? Mm -hmm. uh, and these, I think, are issues that are opening up in, in this whole field that we are skirting around. Mm -hmm. and, and we probably should turn our minds to it, I think, uh, to the tech, tech critical implications, to the for the implications of that for authoring, for, for function, for place of origin, transmission. And I think that would be very helpful. Again, we get into an archaeological mode at that point. But it's just, a, just an additional thought. Yes. I think presenting it just on the textual level doesn't go deeply enough no. into, into the issue. No. I mean, uh, we can't ignore the possibility, too, that um, a number of these texts were produced for commerce. For commercial reasons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they probably sold well something. They sold well. Yeah. Almanacs and things like that. Yeah. Good. Well, we thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Ladies last. So, uh, I have handouts, please. Uh, yeah. uh, can, I, can I speak like this? Any way you want. Okay. Would you like to know? Uh, I, would like, I would like to have my PowerPoint though. Uh, the PowerPoint. Though. I've got no idea how to do anything uh, like uh, that. Uh, okay, uh, I, I, won't, I won't need it straight away, but. Uh, I will. Can you hear it all right? Or do you want the microphone sort of up and out, as it were? <laughs> this, of course, is Florentine, <laughs> Badalanova Gela whom we all know and love, and uh, she's coming to us from Berlin at the moment. Yes. <laughs> the vernacular folk or counterparts of the Book of Genesis are phenomena conventionally excluded from the scope of biblical scholarship. Even if taken into... No, you need your PowerPoint. Yes, so I do. So no, 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 okay. But in the screen as well, I think. Yeah, we do. It's, uh, it's on the thing already. I just uh, thought that. Uh, Sorry. All right. Sure, let's see it. Yeah. 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 Five millimeter slides, the only um, thing went wrong is they could be upside down. <laughs> The vernacular 
folklore counterparts of the book of Genesis are phenomena conventionally excluded from the scope of biblical scholarship. Even if taken into consideration, they are treated with extreme caution. Usually specialists tend to interpret them as a deviation from the canonical text. Although it's generally admitted that the Bible emerged from an ancient oral prototext, Evidence from living contemporary folk traditions is rarely taken into account in modern scholarship. In biblical criticism, oral tradition is regarded as controversial data of little or no significance. It can be argued that folklore versions of the Bible are a specific product of the clandestine connection between the written Judeo-Christian canon and local oral traditions. Furthermore, they represent the unfolding of an oral proto-narrative, the earliest existence of which preceded the actual formation of the biblical text itself. It can be further argued that this written offspring of the original biblical oral proto-narrative have their full counterparts which never cease to exist in vernacular traditions of Judaism, Christianity and Islam. In other words, this orally transmitted proto-Bible provided the fabric and created the background from which the written scriptural corpus eventually sprung. Not only did this proto-narrative foster and nourish the texts which later formed the written fabric of the Bible, but it also partially survives to the present day in oral traditions of many religious communities as clusters of verbal and ritual accounts constituting the framework of their belief systems. Slavonic oral tradition represents one such case. Because together with the written text of the Bible, another Bible existed among the peasant communities in Eastern Europe, a folk Bible, which was orally transmitted among both Jews and Christians, and which changed its appearance at every new performance. Unlike its written counterpart, these unwritten holy scriptures were extant in many oral versions. This can be either this can either relate to the canonical or apocryphal accounts of the Bible or offer renditions alternative to them, thereby revealing the new, previously unknown cluster of folklore texts related to Holy Writ. They, in turn, present a picture of the folk Bible, which appears to be rather elaborate and complex. Analysis of the materials collected indicates that the folk Bible never offers a word-for-word -word reproduction of any of the canonical scriptural stories. Instead, it puts forward a specific frame of reference in which the local systems of religious beliefs together with some universal cultural concepts are incorporated. The folk renditions of Akida, as registered in the Balkans, exemplify this particular interface between folk orality and biblical textuality. This process further includes the relationship between the iconography of religious art and biblical narrative. Significantly, no ritual folk chants of Abraham's sacrifice are registered among Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusians, ritual folk subjects. In fact, only legendary narratives of the Akita theme are attested among them, together with religious folk ballads, who hope the The geography of the Akita type of the Kurban ritual folk songs indicates that they were attested only in the Balkans among both Slavs and Greeks in what could be defined as a contact zone between Jewish Sephardi and Christian communities. Indeed, as the recent study of Alberto Barugel on the interpretation of the theme of the sacrifice of Isaac in Sephardic folk oral tradition shows, the Akira ballads have been in circulation among Jewish communities in Sofia, Adrianopolis, and Salonika, Thessaloniki. In the light of this, a careful argument can be built suggesting that Sephardic, Slavonic, and Greek ballads of Abraham's sacrifice most probably reflect interfaith and inter-ethnic encounters between Jews and Christians, thus focusing on a specific subcultural product, thus forming a specific subcultural product of common Balkan oral heritage. Still, no specific work on this fascinating puzzle yes exists, and so far we lack elaborate comparative evidence supporting such a hypothesis. The beginning of this argument is marked by the pioneering work of Margaret <coughs> Alexio on vernacular interpretation of Genesis in Greek popular tradition, with special emphasis on their association with orally sung indigenous laments on the one hand, and with the early 6th century Greek 
hymn of Abraham and Isaac, composed by Romanus the Melodist, on the other. Of particular significance in this puzzle is the figure of Romanus the Melodist, himself probably a Hellenized Jew, bilingual in Greek and Syriac, who came from Amessa in Syria to Constantinople at the turn of the 5th and 6th centuries. Alexius' work, in turn, was influenced by Sebastian Brock's important contribution on the correlation between ideas of Akeda, attested in Midrashic tradition, and in a number of cumulative writings of the 5th, 6th century, attested in both Greek and Syriac. Brock, however, is reluctant to give a simple answer to the question whether Christian discourse is, and I quote, ultimately based on Jewish sources, now lost, or whether it was an independent product of a general method of exegesis taken over by Christianity from Judaism, end of quote. Instead, he concludes that this kind of problem, and I again quote, bro, does not seem to be a question capable of a firm answer. The same can be said about the intricate relationship between Jewish Sephardic ballad about Abraham and their Slavonic counterparts. Here, I would like to offer you to hear a short recording of a ritual song performed in the remote Christian village of southwest Bulgaria, some 50 kilometers from Salonika, where some of the Sephardic romances in the and ex officio de Isaac were registered. The song was performed at the annual Kurban feast celebrated immediately after Easter on St. George's Day, 6th of May. The song registers the Akira story. Even if you don't understand the language, you hear the name Avram repeated throughout the song. And this is where I record the song. This is uh, the monastery is nearby. And here we can see the people participating in the ceremony. The handouts, and here is the song. <laughs> Repeat, 
repeat the gestures of Abraham, thus symbolically partaking in the scenario of the biblical drama. The man performing the sacred ritual of Kurban sacrifice does not merely act like Abraham, but becomes Abraham and acquires his status as the patriarch of the clan. Then again, the vernacular terminology related to the Kurban ritual settings also called in some areas Ubrok, meaning of pledge, promise, offering, oblation, sacrifice, cherkva or tzerkva, church, temple, crest, cross, crucifix, mulitva, prayer, devotion, invocation, but also litany and communion, slushva, service, ceremony, observance, worship, and even liturgia, liturgy, sacrament. This suggests, this term suggests that this custom is perceived as a functional counterpart of the Eucharist. In this, the Lamb is understood to be a divine substitute for Isaac. The image of Isaac resembles that of Christ. In Slavonic languages, there exists an explicit similarity between the words denoting Lamb, Agnes, and the liturgical formula Lamb of God, Agnes Boji. This similarity, from the point of view of our tradition, is quite significant. It is worth noting that four conversions of the biblical filial sacrifice put a specific emphasis on the fact that the son intended to be slain is to be banned. Moreover, this detail is considered by the storytellers to be of particular importance. Thus, according to the text of one Bulgarian ritual song performed during the Kurban ritual, the boy intended to be sacrificed as his father, Father, my dearest father, tie my hands securely in my hands, father, and my legs, lest I could reach with my hands, lest I could move with my legs. His father tied his hands, his hands, and well, his legs. It should be noted, however, that Salzalonic psalms accompanying the Kurban custom do not always associate the motif of the sacrifice of the son by his own father with the actual names of the biblical father Abraham and his offspring Isaac. Still, the functional framework of these ballads is strictly regulated. The relationship between the performance of the songs and the ritual sacrificing of the lamb intended for the common feast is obligatory, accompanying the act which guarantees life, fertility, and good health for each clan of the village and for the village as a whole. These ballads are mostly performed at the feasting table or during the choro chain dance. They reveal the folklore etiology of the rites and ceremonies related to the sacrificial offering. Before or after the performance of the song about filial sacrifice, the informants usually also narrate the legend of the great ordeal of Abraham, whose hand was stopped by the Lord while he was offering his son. In fact, they hardly ever fail to point out that before Abraham, although Christians used to offer their children as a sacrifice to God, by this remarkable intervention, the Lord ordered that a lamb and not a child should be presented to him. Indeed, the ritual reminder of the slaying of boys as a sacrifice to God has been updated by the symbolic blood staining of the foreheads of children with the sign of a cross. The blood comes from the sacrificial lamb and guarantees them life and good health. Thus, the life of Abraham and his offspring is shared by the village community and therefore becomes an event marking the sacred establishment of the confessional pattern. The sacrifice of Isaac seems to happen and be re-experienced each time, bringing to mind the Christian's commitment to the biblical event and to the destiny of Abraham, who becomes a relative and of course ours by nationality. Indicative in this respect is a substitution in some songs of the name of the biblical patriarch by Slavonic names, Suyan, Lazar, Ivan. In this way, the biblical narrative is transformed into ethno-memory. The book of Genesis is built into the real life of the village community, and the Abraham legend becomes folklore genealogy. One more point. Along with the stories describing the aborted slaying of Isaac, as God wants no human oblation, there are also some texts in Bulgarian folklore, predominantly songs, which are alternative to the storyline of the canonical biblical saga. According to them, Abraham actually kills his son as a sacrificial offering to God. In fact, these accounts correspond to some midrashim in which the theme of the accomplished filial sacrifice also serves as the framework of the plot. In the text of Lekathoth, a 13th century midrash, 
it is stated that Isaac died and was revived by due drops of resurrection, while the Chibolei Hal Leket Hidrash, another collection from the same period, asserts that Isaac was reduced to dust and ashes, after which he was revived by God who used life giving due. This exceptional medieval Midrashim revealed an unexpected account of death and resurrection, the intertextual link between them and Solonic folk texts is astonishing. As far as the Bulgarian Christian oral tradition is concerned, the slain Isaac is resurrected after having been placed in the fiery furnace. The motive of the wondrous child in the burning oven, who is miraculously restored to life in the flames, thus returning from death for a new life, in order to proclaim a new law, a new progression, is kind of this particular type of ritual sign. Despite being an alternative to the canonical text, however, it is regarded by the local community, by local communities, as an exact, truthful, and accurate incarnation of the book of Genesis. One final point. In the biblical text, one cannot find any explicit information about the age of the sacrificed boy. In Slavonic folk ballads, on the other hand, the son victim is usually one or two or three years old. Registered are also versions according to which Isaac is described as seven, nine, twelve year old boy. In some texts, God called upon Abraham to sacrifice his son when he harvested his father's fields for the first time. Slavonic apocryphal state that he was either seven or nine or eighteen. It was also to describe him as a man, as a man age 33 or 37, as in the Book of Jubilees, some Midrashic texts, and indeed Josephus. Jewish and Christian iconography of the Akedah offers the same range of diversity. This, in turn, suggests that the painters constructed their visual narratives against the cluster of extra-canonical texts, some of which were part of their indigenous oral traditions. So, one of the most fascinating uh, visual interpretations of Akida is the one that they call the mosaic floor of Beth Alpha Synagogue, which is 6th century, discovered in 1928. And here we can see uh, Isaac. Hardly this is uh, a, a boy who can carry uh, wood on his, uh, on his shoulders. Here is uh, the little Isaac. How do, ah, yes. Here is the little Isaac, and here is Abraham. and. Uh, here we have uh, um, inscription which is in Hebrew and Greek. The most important thing to which I'll return in my uh, later at the end of my presentation is that actually it is presented here uh, with the mosaic floor here next to the, to the zodiac. Um, a similar uh, age uh, depiction we have in one Eastern Mediterranean amulet from the fifth century. And here is the little tiny Isaac. Here is, uh, here is Abraham holding the sword. Here is the hand of God about to stop him. And here is the ram. Here is the altar and the sky above him. Another uh, Eastern Mediterranean, Western Mediterranean, sorry, uh, uh, bronze figurine. We don't know whether this is Jewish or Christian. When well, we have here Isaac blindfolded, and here Abraham about to sacrifice him with uh, uh, his hand is, is, is missing. And one of the earliest uh, uh, representations uh, of, of uh, um, uh, Abraham Christian representation from Constantinople for this century, most probably here he is uh, uh, about to sacrifice his son, here is the ram, and we're moving towards uh, uh, North Africa, where uh, obviously we, we have a Christian <coughs> Moroccan Jewish communities, and here again we have the same pattern of a boy being seven or, or, uh, or nine, uh, short look at it. This is uh, again Eastern Mediterranean amulets. And here I'm jumping to a Bulgarian uh, 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 representation for an iconostasis uh, uh, of the Church of the Nativity of the Virgin Mary in the city of Berkovitz. You can see here a little boy just very much like the Akida representation in the Beth Alpha synagogue uh, and, and, uh, and the one with the, the, from the Western Mediterranean area. And here is, the, uh, here is the ram and here is the angel stopping Abraham. Again, the boy is uh, blindfolded. Similar representation, Roger Monastery, Nativity of Virgin Mary, again, little Isaac, Abraham, Angel, and the Ram. 
uh, boy, several or nine, uh, on the iconostasis in one of the churches nearby uh, the larger monastery, uh, Abraham is with hello, here we can see, here is the angel stopping him. In the same church, this time mural painting, uh, the boy uh, is obviously, um, again, the age of uh, between 7 and 15, we'll say. And one of my favorite, which is from the Patin Mountains region, because here we have uh, Abraham written, uh, it, 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 they tried to, whoever uh, 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 made this lace, obviously a woman, wanted to, to write uh, Abraham and gave it kind of ultra Slavonic appearance, whereas here we have Abraham written in the opposite way, obviously suggesting maybe a, a, a link with, with the Jewish way of writing. Here we have Isaac and here we have Isaac. A big boy, the brain of his puberty. Here is uh, Abraham from a village of Evernasable area, trying to help out to kill his son. Here is he uh, wearing the wood. Short. Another one from Fresco here, very Shagalic um, uh, uh, Ram. Uh, the same uh, Evan. Uh, here is uh, Isaac, here is uh, Abraham, again with hello, both of them. The same, now we have an Isaac, which is a, now we have Isaac, which is, uh, I think, a boy in 18 or 25 or 33. And uh, we don't know. Here, I said, uh, here I reach to my, yes. This is from the open gallery of the Church of Blagojevrat, southwestern Bulgaria. And here we have Abraham's hand being stopped by angel, and here is Isaac. But what we can see, that this is depicted next, next, to the so-called Pulelopna Jivata, the circle of life, but as a matter of fact, this is uh, zodiac, the science of the zodiac. And this is, on the right-hand side, you have the zodiac, and here we have the story. Unfortunately, the camera couldn't take all of this, but here is uh, the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. Whether this is a coincidence or not, I don't know, but it very much resembles the way in which uh, the Akida was depicted on the floor mosaic floor of Beth Alpha Synagogue. And here I have an answer as to why I think the Akida was depicted on the floor of the Beth Alpha Synagogue next to the Zodiac, because it represents the new year. So this suggestion, to the best of my knowledge, was never put uh, beforehand an explanation as to why we have Beth Alpha Synagogue, uh, the depiction of Akida, at the very beginning, uh, while you enter, and then why is it on the floor, and why it is next to the Zodiac. This is, I think, my answer to this question, which different colleagues try to answer in a different way. Thank you for your attention. Five, five minutes remain for questions. Uh, we're over time anyway. Thank you for attending. That was wonderful. Uh, well, thank you very much for this presentation and I think what you're doing is very important and more than important, it's productive because it's uh, possibly a way to fill certain gaps within traditions, we find written texts and Lorenzo and Yuri talked about that, we find traditions in written texts, work with written texts and don't really know how these traditions are connected, we don't know if they connections are genetic or typological sometimes and there is a good chance that as you showed that uh, it's possible to fill these gaps between these uh, traditions uh, with a folklore. In fact, the ideas are uh, first uh, developed by Custer and nobody took this, uh, uh, took this challenge and I think you are the only one who deals with this uh, intercultural uh, folklore motif. Jewish, Slavic, and uh, other cultures. Uh, and one more thing, 
Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the question is why? Why should we sing those songs? And my feeling is that at least some of the performers, they are puzzled in the question. The they try to <laughs> offer solution. The best solution I find here is that it's good for childless couples. The next solution is that it's kind of explained explains the uh, existing custom of sacrificing a lamb on St. George's Day. So what strikes me is that no one tries to connect it to the Easter and to Isaac as a kind of prefiguration of Christ. No one does it here in the song. Would you comment on it? Except the resurrection. Except for the resurrection bit, of which of is... Of a resurrection of whom? Of Isaac. Isaac. Of Isaac. 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 No, but no one says it explicitly. No, it doesn't need to be said explicitly. What, what's, what's your explanation for that? No, because it's, very, it, it, it's based in, a, in, in this uh, Christian topology, a very well-known topology of Isaac, the Refiguration of Christ, which is, you know, as early as Merito Sardis, which is 2nd century, which is, uh, you know, where, 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 which was suggested, it's uh, uh, Jesus is a new, is a new Isaac because he was carrying no, his. Of course, I know. So simply, you don't need to say it. That's well, of course, there are things which you don't need to say because there are kind of patterns, paradigm, which you know, and then you have two paradigms parallel, and when you ship different uh, components of the paradigms, they're uh, interchangeable. Then they, they, they don't uh, in the base, they, they carry their meaning. Okay, thank you. Thank you for being here. Sure, Mark. This, uh, if you read this recent article by Eric Gunin about the third sibling order, Gruen, whatever his name is. Oh, Eric Gruen. Yeah. yeah, no, I haven't. No, I haven't. It's in this a new book by, published by Oxford with Martin Goodman in the editor. Okay, I'll look at it. And I want to know what you think. I, I didn't know what to make of it. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Because you're working on this. Yes, that's right. Yeah. I will. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a long article. Oh, Thank funny you. Page now, Gruen, I mean, do you know Gruen? I've never met him. Okay. Um, he's a classicist. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, terrific books in Roman history, I'll tell you that. Um, but, um, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not so sure. Yeah, I don't know. He says he refers back to Rome.